Hello everyone, today we're going to respond to a video on the Cambrian Explosion, so let's jump right in. We've dedicated two different videos to dispelling some myths surrounding the Cambrian radiation, and they're in the description. Go check them out. Okay, on to today's video. This comes at us from the channel Long Story Short and is titled Darwin's Biggest Problem Long Story Short Evolution. It's 1859 and there was this guy named Charles Darwin. He rode on a beagle to these islands and had a little idea. Just like humans can take the variety that they saw in animals and breed horses to be faster or dogs to be more hot dog-like, given enough time, old Charlie D figured nature could do the same thing and take even the smallest, slimiest of creatures and create the biggest, most baddest of T-Rexes. Nice. Yeah, that's a decent summary, although it does sacrifice the details for the sake of comedy. Darwin took ideas like the commonly practiced artificial selection, observations of variations in traits, biogeography, fossils, comparative anatomy and behavior, and even Malthusian economics and came to the conclusion that the environment shaped populations of organisms through natural selection. Of course, we still recognize the importance of this process in modern evolutionary biology. But there was one doubt that he couldn't shake, a problem that threatened to undo his entire theory. Here's the story. Well, to be fair, there wasn't just one thing that puzzled Darwin. There were a number of different things. You have to remember that he lived in the 1800s, long before genetics and long before we found most of the fossils we have today. Scientists were also just starting to explore the world, where they discovered way more species than they thought even existed, especially in the traditional biblical folk systematics of kinds. On the biological side, everyone back then was clueless on how inheritance worked, and Darwin was no exception. For instance, Darwin thought that traits were blended, but this led to him being attacked by engineer Fleming Jenkin, who noted that blending traits would average out any beneficial ones. We know today that traits aren't blended, but are coded for by discrete units called genes, solving Jenkin's dilemma. But despite some legitimate difficulties, Darwin was extremely confident in his theory. He notes in The Descent of Man, quote, but the time will before long come when it will be thought wonderful that naturalists, who were well acquainted with the comparative structure and development of man and other mammals, should have believed that each was the work of a separate act of creation." Close quote. To imply that he was doubtful evolution could explain biodiversity is, at the very least, naive. Charles pretty well anticipated and answered most objections that were posed to his theory in The Origin of Species, but had some serious doubts about one in particular. The Cambrian fossils. Darwin expected very gradual change in animals and thus a smooth succession of fossils, but what the fossil showed was the opposite. There was a sudden appearance of wild new animals out of nowhere and they remained essentially unchanged throughout the fossil record. Okay, so there are a lot of issues with this. First, Darwin was wrong in the sense that he expected slow, gradual transitions for all organisms. We know today, thanks to our understanding of punctuated equilibrium, that organisms can undergo rapid, relatively speaking, evolutionary divergence in populations spread over large ranges, followed by prolonged relative morphological stasis. We talked about this in our video, Stasis. Fold in the chronology and the pattern becomes even clearer. We talked about this in the Cambrian Explosion, parts 1 and 2, how organisms weren't the same from the end Precambrian into the Cambrian. The late Precambrian saw the weird Ediacaran forms, like Charnia, and some basic animals, like Dickinsonia, and the bilaterian Kimberella, but the Cambrian was dominated by animals forming a complex ecosystem that were either basal members of taxonomic groups with the rank of phyla, or they were extinct relatives to them, i.e. stem lineages. Which brings us to the statement made by the author that these, quote, wild new animals from the Cambrian explosion remained essentially unchanged throughout the fossil record, close quote. This is repeating one of the three common creationist claims about the Cambrian explosion that we have examined right at the beginning of the video, the Cambrian explosion part one. As noted in that video, most of the flora and fauna that we are familiar with didn't appear until long after the Cambrian explosion had ended. 
The first jawed fish and terrestrial plants appeared in the Ordovician, about 50 million years after the explosion. The first sharks and terrestrial animals, i.e. millipedes, appeared in the Silurian, over 80 million years after the explosion. The first terrestrial vertebrates and insects appeared in the Devonian, over 120 million years later. And the first reptiles and spiders appeared about 200 million years after the Cambrian explosion in the Carboniferous. The first mammals and dinosaurs appeared about 290 million years after in the Triassic. And the first birds appeared about 360 million years after in the Jurassic. The first flowering plants, along with many pollinating insects, appeared over 370 million years after in the Cretaceous. Did they all remain essentially unchanged since the days of the Cambrian? The author showcased Anomalocaris specifically while making the statement that they remained unchanged throughout the fossil record. Setting aside the small error in chronology, Anomalocaris wasn't correctly described until long after Darwin's publication, this creature isn't very similar to anything we have left today. It's one of those extinct stem lineages, a stem arthropod, and it wasn't the only one. More on that later. There were indeed many weird and wonderful organisms in the Cambrian, but they didn't come out of nowhere. Molecular clocks consistently estimate that animals had already existed at least as early as 670 million years ago, and potentially as far back as 1.2 billion years ago, although this number is typically rejected. Meaning that animals were around at least 130 million years prior to the start of the Cambrian. The issue then isn't where animals came from, they were already around, but why they ascended to dominance and developed a complex ecosystem so much later. We talked about that in the Cameron Explosion Part 2. This is a big problem. We're missing a ton of fossils. If we can't find them, it just could prove my whole theory wrong. The fossils don't agree with you, neener, neener, neener. Sure, in Darwin's day, the field of paleontology was in its infancy. There were barely any fossils. As we discussed in An Evolving Understanding, there were only two fossil mammals known from South America when Darwin went there. Today, there are mountains of fossils supporting evolution. The history of life on Earth is far more complicated than Darwin could have dreamed. Harvard paleontologist Louis Agassiz and other prominent naturalists wouldn't let him forget it either. While both of these men have improved our understanding of the Earth's history, Agassiz proposed the concept of the Ice Age and Murchison studied Silurian rocks, both were creationists who opposed speciation. Louis Agassiz also carries some problematic intellectual baggage. Yes, he cleverly figured out that glaciation produced some geological phenomena, but he also couldn't imagine that there were lots of ice ages, not just one. Yeah, okay, you guys are right for now, but what if the fossil record is just incomplete? Don't worry, we'll totally find those fossils later. Boom, problem solved. So tons of younger naturalists, we're talking Joseph Hooker, Thomas Huxley, Ernst Haeckel, Asa Gray, they were convinced. Old coots like Agassiz just missed the boat. See you later, suckers. These Victorian naturalists didn't yet have the data or tools to explore the question much further, so they just held out hope that the fossils would turn up eventually and focus their efforts elsewhere. But that would soon change. I mean, they did the honest thing. They said we don't know yet, so we're going to wait. Evolution by natural selection was already indicated by many different fields of data, so while this was a question for them, it wasn't a huge one. The year's 1909 now, and along comes Charles Doolittle Walcott. He was hanging out up in Canada, digging holes, looking at rocks, when... Dum dum dum... Uh, Chuck, I think I found something. Walcott found the motherlode, an unprecedented trove of immaculately preserved Cambrian fossils. These didn't contain the precursor forms Darwin expected either. In fact, it only made the problem bigger, suggesting an even greater suddenness than Darwin even expected. So, the author will continue to do this throughout the remainder of the video, but I want to address why this is problematic. Charles Darwin died in 1882. Charles Doolittle Walcott discovered the Burgess Shale in 1909. Do you see the problem here? Darwin was long dead by the time Walcott discovered the Burgess Shale, so Darwin didn't see a problem with anything. I understand that the point of adding Darwin to these later discoveries is stylistic, but it implies a false narrative. Anyone not familiar with Darwin's life might think he did indeed say these things when he actually didn't. More importantly, the Burgess Shale contained exactly what Darwin hoped we'd find. It contained the precursors of a number of different clades. Those stem lineages like the stem arthropod anomalocaris that we previously mentioned. The Cambrian holds numerous other arthropod stem lineages and they show us a successive appearance of characteristic features of crown arthropods. 
to name a few closer to our side on the Tree of Life and coming from the Burgess Shale, Pekaia and Metaspergina are basal chordates, or close to them, and these and other fossils found from that period since, in places like China, generally resemble lamprey larvae, which is what early chordates were expected to look like on evolutionary grounds. Our ancestors from the Middle Cambrian look like these forms, a fact which was predicted ironically by naturalist and non-evolutionist Richard Owen in the late 1800s in thinking what generalized archetypes, or the primitive precursors, might look like. Aishaya and Helicogenia are lobopodians, a paraphyletic clade ancestral to onychophorans, tardigrades, and arthropods. These are great transitional forms. Stephen Jay Gould even wrote a whole book on the Burgess Shale called Wonderful Life, where he sees no problem with it. So much for the claim that Burgess Shale created more problems. What about Stephen Meyer's book Darwin's Doubt, which appears to be the author's primary source? Does he bring up these taxa? Well, he doesn't bring up Pekaya in the body of the book and doesn't mention Metaspergina at all. He hand waves away all other basal chordates by pointing out that they appear around the same time and are indeed members of their own clades, which is somehow an argument. He briefly mentions Aishaya once as a lobopodian and mentions Hallucigenia several times, however he never explains where it fits with relation to other organisms. He even cites a 2008 Lou et al. paper that does explain it, but doesn't bother to share this with the reader. It almost seems as though Meyer is avoiding vast swaths of data to build a deck stack narrative against evolution, but not even trying to offer a positive argument for design. Hmm. Okay, so I know this looks pretty bad, but what if, get this, there really are tons of intermediate fossils, and we'll totally find those later, say, under the sea. Fantastic idea, Chuck. I'm sure it'll just sort itself out and won't be a nagging problem for decades to come. No siree. Back to work, boys. Hey, Chuck, good news. We've invented these giant drills that can take samples from the sea floor. How about we finally find those pesky fossils we've been looking for? Awesome idea. Still nothing. Hmm, I wonder what could be the problem. Hmm. This is very misleading. For one thing, the existence of the Burgess Shale and other Cambrian Lagerstaten aren't problematic for any paleontologists. Don't take my word for it. Read their works. Read Gould's book, or Douglas Irwin and James Valentine's more recent book on the Cambrian Explosion, or Donald Prothero's Evolution, What the Fossils Say and Why It Matters. Here, though, we'd never heard this claim attributed to Walcott, so we check Darwin's doubt. Surely enough, Meyer does say this. Meyer also points out that there's no reason to check the seafloor for the ancestors of Cambrian animals because the oldest seafloor is 180 million years old due to tectonic plate movement. Not that we need to anyways, since the Cambrian explosion follows a successive and logical evolutionary pattern. The first eukaryotes showed up about 2 billion years ago and the soft-bodied ediacarans and small first animals appeared over 600 million years ago. Small shelly fauna existed right across the Cambrian boundary, and the first large, hard-bodied animals appeared later in the Cambrian. The radiation itself covers some 25 million years. It started in the Fortunian, 541 million years ago, with the appearance of new body plans and behavioral strategies, like sediment bulldozers in diffusion-dominated benthic systems. This was followed by a major shift from diffusion-dominated to advection-dominated benthic systems during Cambrian Stage 2, 529 million years ago which also marked the appearance of suspension feeders, ecologically coupling benthic and planktonic life. Suspension feeders caused an ecological spillover effect that led to the appearance of deposit feeders in Cambrian Stage 3, 521 million years ago and ending 514 million years ago, establishing a complex ecological food web, again that covers some 25 million years. To put that in perspective, cetaceans went from coastal waders to fully marine flippered beasts, and our entire hominin lineage from the first Australopithecines to spacecraft builders in less time than that. What's non-evolutionary about the Cambrian? Interestingly, the rates of speciation during the so-called Cambrian explosion weren't even unusual, as Bruce Lieberman points out in a 2003 study, quote, Instead, rates of evolution during the Cambrian radiation, at least those pertaining to speciation, were comparable to those that have occurred during other times of adaptive or taxic radiation, throughout the history of life, close quote. And as the 2013 paper by Lee et al. concludes, quote, 
the initial molecular analyses demonstrated that observed rates of molecular evolution could be reconciled with divergences between metazoa and phyla as recently as about 586 million years ago, which, although still predating the Cambrian, is now broadly congruent with recent discoveries of the earliest metazoans. Our results, using updated methods on morphological and genomic scale data, show potentially even greater congruence. Inexplicably, fast rates are not required to explain the Cambrian explosion of arthropods, even under an extreme scenario in which all divergences are compressed into the Cambrian. Rather, the pattern is consistent with many Cambrian lineages exhibiting accelerated, yet plausible, rates of morphological and molecular evolution." Close quote. So, nothing surprising here. But there is more. Two recent papers show that the Cambrian explosion might not be as short or as unique as we once thought. In a paper from Nature published in November 2018, the authors describe two phases of the Cambrian explosion, beginning in the late Ediacaran and extending into the Ordovician radiation. Both phases together in total lasting over 46 million years. The first phase that encompasses the development of a complex ecosystem within 25 million years, as previously mentioned, uh, was dominated by stem lineages, and the second phase is marked by the radiation of crown lineages. The two phases are separated by the Sinsk extinction event that devastated the stem lineages and allowed the crown lineages to compete and replace their stem predecessors. And another paper from Nature, published in March 2019, that cites the previous paper, concludes, quote, We argue that the Ediacaran Cambrian record can be considered to be a succession of assemblages with the establishment of Cambrian crown group animal ecosystems built on several successive Ediacaran advances, as well as environmental and biotic feedbacks. There is currently no compelling evidence for either significant competitive replacement or biotic replacement from the latest Ediacaran to the Cambrian. Indeed, we conclude that a discrete Cambrian explosion event is difficult to temporarily isolate or indeed to define. The rise of early metazoans can be more simply and holistically recast as a series of successive transitional radiation events, perhaps mediated by a complex environmental change, which extended from the Ediacaran and continued to the early Paleozoic. While the Cambrian explosion represents a radiation of crown group bilaterians, it was simply one phase amongst several metazoan radiations, some older and some younger." Close quote. One final note, drill cores can actually retrieve fantastic fossils documenting the transition of different groups of organisms, especially diatoms and forams. These fossils can then inform us on certain paleoclimates and be used as index fossils to infer the age of strata. The answer wasn't under the sea either. The more they looked for the missing fossils, the more it confirmed Darwin's initial doubt. Some attempts were made to explain it, but they really fell short. Oh, oh, I know, maybe the Precambrian animals just didn't have enough hard bits that could survive the fossilization process. Those silly, squishy Precambrian animals, you know how they're so soft and squishy. Good news, everybody, we found some fossilized jellyfish. Isn't that cool? And sponges, wow, how lucky of us. Okay, well, what if the fossils we're looking for, maybe they're just too small for us to see. That explains why we can't find them, because they're so teensy tiny. Now, oh, more good news, my dudes. We found fossilized bacteria. Isn't that so, so weird? What's wrong? <laughs> okay, so this is also misleading in several different ways. The first is an issue of taphonomy, which we covered in a video of the same name. Understand that the fossil record is, and always will be, incomplete because only a small fraction of life fossilizes. You'd never know it from reading Darwin's Doubt, but only about half of the animal phyla have a fossil record at all, let alone one tracking all the way back to the Cambrian. And if you're a soft-bodied organism, then you're even less likely to fossilize unless you end up in a lagerstadt, which most don't. We know that most Precambrian organisms were soft-bodied, which is why paleontologists rely on Lagerstaten to get an understanding of them. So the fact that we find rare instances of soft-bodied organisms doesn't mean taphonomy is no longer an issue when it comes to the rarity of soft-bodied organisms from the Precambrian or any other period. Unfortunately, Precambrian Lagerstaten are quite rare despite life encompassing some 3.5 billion years prior to the start of the Cambrian. The potential ancestors of the Cambrian phyla would have been small and contained no fossilizable hard parts, meaning they'd be functionally invisible in any deposit below Lagerstadt class. 
You have to remember, though, that life was unicellular until at least 2 billion years ago, and unicellular organisms don't typically leave fossils either. That's why most fossils of single-celled organisms that we find are the structures that bacterial colonies leave behind, such as stromatolites. There are examples, as the video mentions, such as the Bitter Springs Formation, 896 to 767 million years ago, which records cyanobacteria and some microscopic eukaryotes. Later, the Duchantois Formation, 635 to 551 million years ago, houses algae, acrotarchs, ciliates, sponges, and cnidarians, though a lot of these are phosphatized embryos, a process that can't preserve anything bigger than half a millimeter. You won't learn that from reading Steve Meyer either. Later still, Mistake in Point, 565 million years ago, records the earliest Ediacaran fauna such as Charniodiscus. Lastly, there's Ediacara Hills, 550 to 545 million years ago, which houses most of the famous Ediacarans. Something very interesting was going on in biology, including signs of predation and eventually subsurface burrowing, but none of these deposits show the depth of preservation detail as the big three Lagerstaaten known from the Cambrian, Sirius Pesset in Greenland, Chengjing in China, and the Burgess Shale in Canada. Further limiting the inferences, all of those Cambrian ones belong to a tropical equatorial environment. The plates have moved around a lot since. So scientists don't have available a broad sample of Lagerstaat microscopes across the entire planet, or documenting the most relevant time slices. So yes, our ancestors were soft-bodied for a long time. In addition, they were tiny. The closest relatives of animals are unicellular coenoflagellates and philisterians. Being tiny and soft-bodied isn't very conducive to fossilization. That's why so many microscopic fossils are the hard-bodied forams and diatoms and tough pollen spores. The video's author acts like these aren't legitimate issues when they are. The author acts like, because we've found soft-bodied and microscopic fossils, we should be guaranteed ancestral animal fossils. But we're not. The fossil record doesn't guarantee anything, it's a complete scattershot. Aside from that, finding definite animal fossils in the Precambrian confirmed the prediction that the kingdom started before the Phanerozoic. In that case, many animal phyla, including Porifera, Tenophora, Placozoa, Cnidaria, and probably Xenocelomorpha, among others, were up and evolving before the Cambrian. That includes the earliest protostomes and deuterostomes, our own ancestors. So, as said earlier, the issue is less where the animals came from, but more why they ascended to prominence later. Hey, look at this! DNA! Pretty cool, right? Ooh, swirly. Who needs fossils anyway? Pfft, what even are they? Rocks? Big deal. DNA. This is the key to evolution. Even though Darwin's elusive pre-Cambrian fossils never turned up, the steady march of science progressed elsewhere, and it shored up the theory in the minds of its supporters. DNA in particular was giving up its secrets and provided a whole new insight into life. All the cool scientists were on board. Forget fossils, everybody knows evolution is a fact, and we all lived happily ever after- oh no, what is this? Okay. By the time Watson and Crick figured out the structure of DNA, Darwin had been dead for over half a century. Him, or anyone else, saying, who needs fossils anyway, is literally made up. At best, it's a misunderstanding of scientists saying that evolution via common descent is fully supported by other lines of evidence, from genetics in particular, even if we didn't have a single fossil. But that doesn't mean we completely ignore fossil data. And Darwin's writings make pretty clear that he never even would have said this. That's why he devoted two chapters in Origin to talking about the fossil record. If there is anyone in the 19th century who wouldn't have been more delighted at what we know today about the Cambrian fossil record, it would be Charles Darwin. And researchers to this day very much rely on fossils. However, as stated before, evolution would still be true even if we didn't have any fossils due to DNA alone. Lastly, and this is just a nitpick, whether or not Neo-Darwinism is the modern synthesis kind of depends on your definition of Neo-Darwinism. The pairing of Darwinian mechanisms with Mendelian inheritance begat Neo-Darwinism, but the addition of so many new mechanisms of evolution has caused a number of researchers to drop the term. Because the rest of the video is an attack on Neo-Darwinism, we're going to take that together in a second part. So far though, Meyer's arguments, and the author's regurgitation of Meyer's arguments, have not been impressive. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.